Okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our class to BC 214, Developing the Human Spirit. We are learning, gaining some insight on the inner person, on the spirit, and how we can, what we can do to develop our spirit so that we can walk with God, co-labor with God, and serve God well. Let's take a moment to pray before we get in to today's um, lesson. May I request somebody to please pray with the class, and then we'll get started. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the class we are about to have. We thank you that you are a God who lives within us. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the Spirit that you have given us. God, as we are learning more about the Bible in our school, help us to uh, understand the deep truths in your Bible and to get more closer in our relationship with you so that we can be a blessing to others. Be with us and guide us throughout the session. We bless our pastor and we pray for all our classmates. Uh, give us good Wi-Fi connection throughout the session and let everything that we do be done for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. All right. So today we're going to. So last week we talked about living, walking, and being led by the Spirit. So very important that as we are developing our spirit, we come into this place where we are living in the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, and being led by the Holy Spirit. So we looked at two parallel passages, Ephesians 5 and Galatians 5. Today, we want to talk about the functions of the human spirit. So the human spirit, spirit being in us, what functions does the human spirit. So, now we are talking about, uh, of course, the born again human spirit, and uh, how you know the, the human spirit serves uh, us. What is the important important function? So we talked about the five faculties of this human spirit, which we need to keep on developing, getting better at. The five faculties, uh, you know, our ability to see, hear, sense and smell and taste in the spirit. Now we're talking about seven functions of the human spirit. And I will just outline them and then talk about each of these seven functions. The seven functions that we're going to look at, one is conscience. Then second has to do with knowing or knowledge. Third is communion or we could use the word fellowship. Fourth, we can be, and I'm just using the word container, or we can use the word dispenser, container or dispenser, or being a channel. A fifth function is uh, identity, uh, or having this uh, the, the true characteristics or the identity of the person. Number six is action. That means we can actually do things in the spirit. And number seven, growth, which is growing into Christ likeness. So we want to talk about these seven functions. That means we need to understand that the human spirit is actually to be developed and to you know we it serves in this manner within us and um, when we want to get things down we want to uh, and operate from the spirit into the natural this becomes very important so we talk about each one number one conscience what is conscience? Conscience is 
the voice of the spirit of the human spirit it is the voice of the human spirit it is the human spirit speaking that is conscience now the bible does say a lot about the conscience um, in Romans chapter 2 it says that the law of God is written in the conscience of every person uh, so uh, give me the exact verse here in uh, Romans chapter 2 and uh, verse 15 the law is written in our hearts and their conscience bears witness that means God's when uh, when when uh, so it's like this when when a person is created that sense of right and wrong the law of God is put into the spirit of the person Romans two fifteen and that spirit is telling the person it's 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 the voice of that spirit based on the law of God that's programmed in there is the conscience. It's telling the person what's right, what's wrong. Now, so a person doesn't even need to be a believer to know right and wrong, because the law of God is put in the heart of every person, and they know what's right and wrong. But over time, the conscience can be Steered, it can be literally can be killed. The voice of the conscience can be suppressed. So, if a person, you know, uh, stops listening to their conscience, the voice becomes smaller and smaller, weaker and weaker. And then they reach a point where we say, "Look, this person has no conscience." What does it mean? It means that. Uh, the voice of their own spirit has been so suppressed they don't feel bad about doing the wrong thing and their conscience is no longer correcting them but for a believer the conscience is so important because as we now feed our spirit with the word of God and are learning the things of God our conscience should become clearer and clearer, telling us this is right, this is not right. And uh, if you turn a bit to Acts chapter 21, uh, the Apostle Paul, um, Acts 20, sorry, let me give you the exact verse. Yeah. Hmm. Um, I have lived an all good conscience. I'm sorry. Acts twenty one. Okay, one minute. Let me just look at this. Um, where Paul says, the Apostle Paul, uh, I'm just looking for that verse there, where Paul is saying, you know, brethren, I have lived in all good conscience. 23 verse 1, Pastor. Oh, okay. 23 verse 1. Thank you, thank you. That's the verse. Acts 23 verse 1. Acts 23 verse 1. Thank you, John. So the Apostle Paul says, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. So he is uh, he so look he, he at this point when he's making the statement in Acts 23, he is a believer. So just because he became a believer, he didn't stop living by his conscience, right? So you can imagine before he was under the law, he, was, he wasn't a believer, but he was following the law. So he had his conscience being, you know, being active. He was trying to do what's right, you know, follow the right thing and avoid the wrong. 
Now Paul becomes a believer. He's a preacher of the gospel. He's continuing, you know, he's serving God. But what we can see is he's continuing to live by his conscience. And so here in Acts 23, he says, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. The point is this, as believers, we don't stop living by our conscience. In fact, as believers, our conscience, the voice of our own spirit should become clearer and it should become more louder, stronger. So that's the function of the Spirit. So how do we make use of this? In, uh, in our decisions, when you're making decisions, you simply have to ask, what is my conscience telling me? Because our conscience is going to tell us right and wrong. And like Paul is saying, I have lived with a good conscience or a clear conscience. That means I did not go against my own conscience. I, I followed my conscience. You know, so uh, sometimes we, we think about even believers. It's so like, how could that person even have do that? I mean, couldn't wouldn't his conscience have told him that was wrong? And yet they went, went ahead and did some wrong thing. Why? Because they were not listening to their own conscience. They were not paying attention to their own conscience, telling them, hey, this is wrong. Don't do it. Okay. So as believers, we must listen to our own conscience. And then what we will find is that many times the the Holy Spirit is is bearing witness with our conscience. So if you look with me in Romans chapter nine and verse one, Romans nine verse one. Can somebody read it, please? Romans nine verse one. Romans 9 verse 1, I tell the truth in Christ and not lying, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. Mm. So now, our conscience and there is also the work of the Holy Spirit. So, the conscience is bearing witness it's actually telling me the same thing that the Holy Spirit wants to tell me. So, if we have a good conscience, that means we have developed our human spirit, we have put the right things in our spirit, the Word of God, uh, growing in the spirit. If you just listen to your conscience, your conscience is bearing witness with you is bearing witness with the Holy Spirit. Meaning your conscience is going to tell you the same thing the Holy Spirit will tell you. Because you have developed your spirit, you've kept it clean, you kept conscience, you've kept your spirit clean, you've kept your conscience clean. So you can just make a decision saying, if you say my conscience is not letting me do it, well, the Holy Spirit will not let you do it. My conscience is, yeah, my conscience is clear, okay then the Holy Spirit will also bear witness with that. You know, it's, it's, your conscience has been brought into that place. It's been kept in that place, but it's a good conscience. It's the voice of your own spirit, and it is now in a place where, the, you know, what your spirit is saying, your human spirit is saying, will also be aligned to what the Holy Spirit is saying. They are both in alignment. You know, so... If we keep, if we maintain a good conscience, we feed our spirit with the word of God, keep it clean, uh, we can listen to our conscience. And if our conscience is telling, don't do that, then listen to your conscience. You know that your conscience will keep you from doing what is wrong, just like how the Holy Spirit will tell you, don't do something. Right? So, this is one function of the human spirit. It is serving as a guide 
to what's right and wrong. Of course, the Holy Spirit is also going to tell you what's right and wrong. But when we train our own human spirit with the Word of God, the law of God written in our hearts, and we keep our conscience clean, keep it good, then the conscience begins to be a voice inside of us telling us what's right, what's wrong. It's the voice of the human spirit that is in submission to God. Okay, is it clear? Yeah. Any questions on that? It's clear, everyone's following. Okay. Pastor, in, yes, in, go case, ahead. in case of a believer who uh, continues to uh, dwell in sin, mm. we also uh, know uh, this verse in First Thessalonians 5, I guess, do not quench the Holy Spirit inside of you. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. Would it come to a place that Holy Spirit no longer responds and he is hurting inside of a believer? Yes, yes. So... See, what happens is um, the conscience can be seared. So if you look at the um, example of uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, uh, Paul is telling us uh, you know, that people can have a seared conscience. That means seared actually means like if you take a hot iron and you put it on you know, a person's... Uh, you know, put on skin, it, it, it really burns. Uh, and, and eventually that, 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 that part, you know, becomes a, a scab and it's burnt, it's hurt, it cannot feel. It's almost like that. So for a believer, if he fails to listen to his own conscience, he is searing, he's subduing or suppressing his own conscience. If he's failing to listen to the Holy Spirit, he is grieving the Holy Spirit. So there are two dynamics happening here. One his, is his own conscience, the voice of his own conscience. If a believer is not paying attention to his own conscience, he is going to suppress the voice of his own conscience. The Holy Spirit is also speaking to us as believers. The Holy Spirit is guiding us, he is uh, motivating us, he is He's also at work. If you don't listen to the Holy Spirit, what we do, we grieve, we quench, we fight against the Holy Spirit. So there are two dynamics, right? If I don't listen to the Holy Spirit, I'm grieving the Holy Spirit. If I don't listen to my own conscience, I am suppressing my own conscience. And eventually I will, like it's a sear it or, or kill it to the place where I, the voice of my <coughs> conscience is no longer coming out loud. I hope I clarified it. Yeah? Yes, yes, Pastor. Yeah? Pastor, uh, what about guilty conscious? Uh, like uh, normal people also mention about this, like uh, unbelievers also. Uh, would it is it different from um, the conscience that we have as believers when you no know, temptations come or uh, any kind of uh, negligence come from our side? Is it different uh, for a believer than for a non-believer? Um, so the guilt we feel is because uh, we have done something wrong when our conscience has told us not to do it. Right? So example, if my if uh, my, my conscience is saying, okay, don't steal, but I went and I stole something, then I feel something in, my, in me, I feel bad, because my conscience told me, don't do it, it's not the right thing, you know. But I still went and did it. So my own conscience is telling me now I've done something wrong. So that guilt is there. So both believers and non-believers who have not, you know, they have not yet suppressed or they have not killed their own conscience uh, will feel that. They'll feel the guilt. But for us as believers, what do we do? We repent. We, we know how to clear our conscience. That means we go before God and we say, God, I did something I know I'm not supposed to do. I acknowledge my sin. I receive the cleansing of the blood of Jesus. And I know I'm forgiven. So what happens? We clear our conscience. That means that guilt goes away because we brought it under the blood of Jesus. But 
uh, for a for a, for a non-believer, they they don't know how to do it. So the only way they can do it is they ignore it. They try to suppress that guilt. Right? They they they're not they haven't acknowledged that what they've done is wrong, but they just try to suppress it. So then what happens? They can do more wrong and suppress it. So ultimately, the sensitivity to right and wrong goes down, and then at some point, they can do wrong and not feel guilty about it at all. Yes, Basia. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, the first function of the Spirit is, it is, it provides our conscience. The voice of the Spirit is our conscience. It tells us what's right and wrong. Uh, this acts as a guide to us. And uh, this is in addition to the witness of the Holy Spirit. right? And many times, if we have a good conscience, then the voice of the conscience will agree with the voice of the Spirit. But our responsibility is to have a good conscience. Keep our conscience good, clean, clear, and don't suppress it. And as... and as we do the things we have learned in this course, right, to build up our spirit, then our conscience is going to become very clear, it's going to become strong, and it becomes a, a, when we say, a dependable guide to what's right and what's wrong. So we just say, listen to your conscience. Yeah, so sometimes people come and say, what should I do? Should I do this? Do I do that? Simple answer, what is your conscience telling you? Right? Oh, okay. My conscience telling me I should not do it, then don't do it. Yeah. So listen to your own conscience because it's the voice of the human spirit. And God has given that to us. Right? Romans 2.15. He has put his law in our hearts, and our conscience is testifying to us. It is speaking to us, telling us this is right, this is wrong. So that's the first function of the human spirit. And uh it is a useful thing, especially when you're trying to make decisions. It's okay, what do I feel in my conscience? Is my, does my conscience let me do this? And if you feel like, no, my conscience is not letting me do it, don't do it. You know, especially as a believer who has been developing your spirit with the Word of God and with the Holy Spirit, you can listen to your conscience. The second function of the human spirit that we are going to look at is knowing or knowledge. So just like our, you know, I'm just drawing a parallel here, just like as our soul becomes a repository of information or knowledge about natural things, right? So we engage with this world, we understand, we learn, so also the spirit is a means by which we gain knowledge about spiritual things. And if your spirit understands it, then your mind will catch up with spiritual things. So spiritual things are first understood in the heart. And then it comes into our cognition, that is our natural understanding, the understanding of the mind. So we call this as revelation, revelation knowledge or spiritual knowledge. That means your spirit is understanding it. Your spirit is receiving it first, and you're knowing it in the in your heart or in your spirit. So, example, salvation. You gave your life to Christ, you got saved. Are you saved? Yes, I'm saved. How do you know? Like, how do you know salvation? How do you know sonship? Well, I just know Jesus is my Savior. And you got a birth certificate, or what is it? In the natural, nothing, right? It's a knowing in our spirit because the spirit is bearing witness with our spirit. 
that we are the children of God. So there's something in my spirit, or there's the knowledge that is in my spirit that says, I'm a child of God, I know it, God is my father. And then the mind begins to slowly understand some of these things. Right? So Paul explains this to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, where you know that, that entire passage is contrasting the natural man and the spiritual man, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And uh, yeah, so he says, uh, verse 10, God, 1 Corinthians 2, 10, God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things as the deep things of God. And verse 11, for what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. So what's he saying? He's saying, the Holy Spirit knows everything. And the Holy Spirit reveals them to us. But where does he reveal them to us? He said, in the Spirit of the man. So the Spirit of the man, which is in him, he knows the things of the man. He knows the things that are inside the man. So your spirit is what really knows these things. And then he continues in verse 12. Somebody could read verse 12, please. First Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Mm. So the Holy Spirit helps us know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Right? The Holy Spirit is the one who makes it known to us. And then he explains in verse 14 that the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit. They are foolishness to him. He cannot, he cannot know them. But they are spiritually discerned or spiritually understood. So it's my spirit that will know. So uh, if you go to Ephesians 1, again, Paul is telling us here in Ephesians 1, he points out what we should know. He says, sorry, he says, uh, verse 17, that, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know, that you may know. And so he uses this word know several times. He, I want you to know the hope of his calling, the riches of his inheritance, the greatness of his power towards us. And then in the previous verse, that you may know him, four things, that you might know him. So this knowing comes when the eyes of our understanding are enlightened, the eyes of our heart or our spirit is enlightened. And the Spirit of God makes known these things to us. Okay, so the second function, the human spirit serves, is in knowing and in receiving the, the knowledge of spiritual things. In knowing Him, in knowing uh, the purpose of our calling, in knowing our inheritance, in knowing the power of God. Four things he mentions here in Ephesians 4.17. To 19. So where do we know these things? We know them in our spirit. Okay, so therefore we must live out of what we know in the spirit. And this is a challenge because there are things we also know in the in the natural. But there are things we also know in the Spirit. And we have to be absolutely convinced, we have to have a conviction of these things, these spiritual things that we, have, that we know of in our spirit. And we choose to live out of that. We choose to live out of the things we know in the Spirit. Example, you know, last... last uh, Last, uh, I think it was Saturday, 
last Saturday. Uh, this happened in a, in a place where we stay. Um, so one of our there's there was there's this another brother and his wife who live right in the, in the building next to us, and I, I found out that Saturday morning that they one of their cats had slipped out of the house and gone somewhere, disappeared. And on that happened on Thursday night. So Thursday, Friday, this was Saturday morning. The cat had not come back, and they were so. Uh, very disturbed. The first time I heard it, I mean, I didn't think about it so much, but I just, you know, and I could see this brother was very, very disturbed. But at that moment, the thought that went through my mind was, why didn't we send the angels of God to bring the cat back? Right? Now, I know this sounds, it might sound very silly, but there is a natural situation the cat has, you know, gone away somewhere. We don't know. They lost the cat. The family's been very upset. But there is spiritual knowledge. The knowledge that there are angels who are sent to minister. So, uh, I know it sounds it sounds silly because in the natural, it's like, hey, where are angels? We don't see them. We can't say, you know, this angel, go do this. You can't do that. But this is spiritual knowledge, something you know in the Spirit, through the Word of God and through the witness of the Holy Spirit. And so we actually prayed, oh God, send your angels. Let your angels go and, you know, get, get this cat back. You know? So it's a crazy kind of prayer, but why do we pray that way? Because we know of spiritual realities. We have knowledge in our spirit of things that the natural mind has no knowledge about. The natural mind has no knowledge about these things. But the spirit knows through the word of God. And you want to live out of that knowledge. Yeah? And then sure enough, that night, they found the cat. You know, they, they got the cat back. And so it's, it was such a, for them, it was like a very big thing, you know, it was really, it was a big, you know, blessing. But I just wanted to point out the process where we face the situation, but we chose to live out of what we know in the spirit and not limit ourselves to what we know in the natural. So your, your spirit is a repository of knowledge of spiritual things, of things that are of the other world, or the unseen world. And so we need to keep developing that. How do we do? feed your spirit with a spiritual revelation, with spiritual understanding, with the knowledge of spiritual things? Keep feeding. Of course, we do it through the Word of God and through the revelation that comes from the Holy Spirit. You keep feeding it so that your spirit is filled with the knowledge of these things, and then you live out of that knowledge. Okay, that is very important. Second important function. Now, think about a believer who doesn't fill his spirit with the knowledge of spiritual things. Then what happens? Then this believer will be living primarily out of the knowledge of natural things, with just the natural knowledge. Whereas the spirit has not been developed, it has not been filled with the knowledge of spiritual things, and so with, they're not living out of that uh, knowledge. They don't have that knowledge to live out of, and so their life is just very confined to uh, the knowledge of natural things. But really, we have to fill our spirit with spiritual revelation and knowledge. So that's the second function. Third function. Our spirit enables us to commune with God. So this is important. Because this is the place where we build relationship with God. Right? Communion with God, fellowship with God. It happens in the spirit. It is spirit to spirit. So we have been designed by God as spirit beings so that our spirit can commune with God. Which means even when the mind and the body may be feeling tired or maybe feeling 
you know, whatever. The, the mind of the body can go through lots of things, but our spirit can still commune with God. We can still fellowship with God. We can still engage with God. Now, the problem is many times we let our mind or our body dictate our communion with God. Example, oh, I'm feeling sad. I'm not going to pray. Well, I know we all feel sad. Or we could feel upset about something that happened, or we could feel disturbed about something that happened. But my communion with God should not be dictated by my feeling. Because my spirit is what communes with God. So while I may feel, you know, yeah, it is a it is a genuine emotion, you know, something has happened. Of course we feel the emotion, we feel sad or disturbed or troubled or whatever, we're, we're feeling it, yeah. But I can still commune with God in my spirit. I shouldn't let the feeling suppress, no. My spirit was designed to commune with God. So in my spirit, I can still reach out to God, say, God, I know I'm feeling like this, but I'm going to fellowship with you. I'm good. I, I can worship you. I can hear from you. I can... Uh, be close to you. I can draw strength from you. I can draw encouragement from you. I can listen to what you are saying in my spirit. That communion with God can still happen, even despite what's happening in the soul and in the body. So that's important to understand that the spirit, one of the functions of this human spirit, is to have communion with God. And that communion should not be dictated by soul and body. Now, of course, our body needs rest, our soul needs, but mind needs rest, and we give time to take care of that. We, I understand that. But what I'm trying to emphasize is there are times when we can commune with God, even if the soul and the body may not be fully you know, excited about that. So, Continue to develop this aspect of communion. Your spirit was designed uh, for communion. That's one of the functions of the spirit. And you and I can continue to keep growing in our fellowship and our communion with God. Number four is the spirit is a container. That means you can fill up in order to pour out. So we must understand the function. But if this container is empty, it's going to be difficult to pour out. So my spirit is a container. It's a carrier, it's a dispenser, or you can say, you can use the word channel. So, you know, all these words are very, very meaningful. It's a container, it's a carrier, it's a dispenser, it's a channel. That means out of my spirit, I can release, I can give. So in the natural example, suppose I, I have my wallet and uh, you know, I have a certain amount of money in my wallet. Somebody comes and asks me for you know, something. And if, I'm, if, it's, you know, if it's in my wallet, I can give it. Because I have it, I can give it. Now, that's in the natural. In the spiritual, your spirit is a carrier. It's a reservoir. It's a place where you deposit and withdraw. It's a place through which you dispense the grace, the power, the glory of God. So you said, from your spirit you release. From your spirit you release. Right? So that is so important. And here again, I want us to emphasize keeping the spirit function independent of natural. That means sometimes you may, in the natural, you may feel weak, you may feel inadequate, you may feel insufficient, etc. But you can still dispense. I think one some example to illustrate this is in John 4, when Jesus was by the well in Samaria. Jesus was tired and he was thirsty. So in the natural, you can just imagine, you know, he may not have been feeling very great, tired, thirsty, sitting by the well. But the woman comes to draw water. But at that moment, he is dispensing the power of God, the glory of God, because 
He has a word of knowledge for this woman. Go call your husband. So I don't have any husband. It's okay. The, the man you're living is, you know, you've had five husbands. The man you're living now is not your husband. So what's happening? You can imagine. Physically, he must be very tired. He's been walking. He's sitting there. Disciples have gone into the village to buy food. He's waiting. But at that time, out of the spirit, he is ministering. And he's releasing a word of knowledge which impacts this woman's life. And her whole life is changed. She goes and calls people from the village. Right? So your whole spirit is a container. It's a carrier. It's a reservoir. It's a dispenser. It's a channel of the glory and the power of God, all that God has put in you. Then you put the word of God into your spirit. The power of God is there. And from your spirit, you're going to release or you're going to pour out, whatever, you know, however you want to look at it. But it is through your spirit the grace, the glory, the power of God is going to be released. And you and I can be intentional about it. God, I want to release into this person or minister to this person. Last two things. Or, sorry, we've got three more things here. Um, identity. This is important. That just as in the natural we have identity, your spirit is carrying your identity in the spiritual world. So when the spiritual world looks at you, they're not looking at your outer form, the natural. They are looking at your identity in the spirit. So you know, in Acts 19, when the evil spirits are speaking, they say, "Paul, Jesus, I know. Paul, I know. Who are you?" That means, in the spiritual realm, they have recognized Jesus. Of course, that's the Lord. And they recognize this man, Paul. Or when the in Acts 16, when the woman is crying out, the even possessed woman, she says, These men are the servants of the most high God. So that evil spirit is recognizing their identity in the spiritual, not in the natural. Oh, them in the natural, they're ordinary people, they are walking around, but the spirit is saying, they are the servants of the Most High God. You know, so where is that identity? It's in your spirit, who you are spiritually. Right. So this is something you must understand. You are carrying an identity. Your spirit is carrying an identity in the spirit world. That of identity, of course, we all know, is who we are in Christ, and who God has made us to be in Christ. So everything that God has given to us as part of our identity in Christ is what our spirit is carrying. The problem is, earlier, point number two, we must know this. We must know this so that we can live out of that identity or live according to that identity. Right. So in the natural, you know, if somebody is, uh, is the you know, the son or the daughter of an example, a very prominent person. If they, you know, so because they know it, they behave that way. So I am the son of so and so, and they behave that way. They're living in accordance to their identity. They're living out of that identity and the privileges that come with that identity in the natural. So much so in the spiritual. You are carrying an identity in the spirit. That identity has already been given to you by God. And we must know that identity and live out or live in accordance to that identity. This And that identity doesn't change. Regardless of how we feel. Yeah. Your spirit is carrying that identity all the time. All the time. So that's a function of the spirit. Now we have to live in accordance to it. Number six, your spirit can take action. Just as in the natural, you know, we can do things. You know, we can use our hands and so on and so forth. We can get things done in the natural. You must understand that your spirit can get things done in the spiritual world. 
and through the spiritual world it can affect the natural world you know so the spirit can do things like believe it can serve it can intercede it can fight it can speak it can exercise faith these are action things that the spirit can do that can have consequences in the spiritual world and thereby impact or affect the natural world which means you and I can handle matters in the spirit that's very important so let's say some circumstance some situation you can say okay you know in the natural you may be able to do a few things fine but you say I'm gonna handle this in the spirit I'm gonna take this up in the spirit because I know my spirit can take action in the spiritual realm I can use my faith I can pray I can make declarations I can you know intercede I can stand before God and pray I can take action in the spiritual realm and thereby affect the natural realm so the human spirit one of the functions is it can take action it can make things happen but in the spiritual realm which has its effect in the natural realm so example when Jesus calmed the storm it was his spirit that was operating not the natural I mean there was nothing he could do in the natural to calm the storm and he can't suppress push them down with his hands or nothing but he spoke words peace be still what was happening his spirit was releasing words and those words affected the natural so that's the function your spirit serves it can get things done it can take action it can make things happen but we follow the instructions God has given to us in the word he says, act, use your faith, you can pray, you can intercede, you can declare the word, you know. So you take action in the spirit and change things in the natural. The last function that we want to talk about is continuous growth. Right? So the spirit is not uh, in a place of, it's not, it's not stagnant. It's not like, okay, I've reached there and I cannot go on. No, the spirit can keep on growing, developing. It can keep on increasing in all of these things that we have mentioned. It's communion, it's knowledge, it's, you know, the conscience can get clearer, the actions can get stronger, uh, the uh, things we've mentioned it what it carries will then increase so there's always growth that can take place in the spirit so we must understand that because then we will be intentional about developing the spirit intentionally growing in the spirit so think about these seven functions this is what your spirit human spirit what you spirit inside you is meant to do to be your conscience to gain knowledge of spiritual things to commune with God to be a container of the glory and the power of God and to dispenser of the glory and power of God it is your identity in the spiritual realm it can do things can take action and it can continually grow and develop so these are the seven functions of the spirit any questions on this all right, I see a question in the chat. What should be done when a pastor has robbed the church money? Will prayer of asking forgiveness will help or he should pay back also? Um, yeah. So the Bible teaches us both repentance and restitution. Repentance is telling God, I'm sorry. Repentance is also telling people, I'm sorry. But restitution is action that follows repentance so in the bible you know it's put like this bring forth fruits that are 
suitable or fit for your repentance. So that's restitution. Means to whatever extent possible, I must correct the wrong I've done. Right. So to answer your question, Rosalind, you know, if a, somebody has stolen money from the church, well, it's one thing to say I'm sorry and ask forgiveness. That's important to realize that. But they also must restitute or make restitution, which is, hey, whatever you've taken wrongfully, put it back. Take it, you know, return it to whatever possible extent. You know, so uh, that restitution must be there. In fact, the Bible proverb says, if a thief steals and he's caught, he must restore seven times. You know? So I'm not saying we should go and tell them to do it seven times, but I'm just saying restitution is there and uh, it must happen. Okay, uh, Let's uh, close in prayer, please. Could somebody pray and let's close. Yes. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the truths that we learned today. We thank you for this food. We thank you for the functions that we can do for us. Today. We thank you that we can keep developing in our spirit and we can change the natural journey through the spiritual journey. We thank you for the authority that you have given us, your love, your amazing grace, the power that you have placed within us. God, we stand in all of you. We stand in all of your works, and we thank you for all these things, Lord. And God, I pray that each and everything that we learn today about the spirit, the consciousness, the identity, the container, the knowledge, and God, whatever we learn, and I pray that we will keep growing in those areas by getting deeper into your word, by spending more time with you, and by listening to you, uh, so that we can be a blessing to others, so that we can live a life that glorifies you. Lord. We give you all the glory and honor in Jesus' name. I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. God bless. We'll continue this next week. See you. God bless. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.